L-I-P-L-M. Hello, my name is Ben Weisenberger. I'm an application engineer with Ally PLM Solutions. I want to welcome you to the Ally PLM Lunch Bite series. In today's video, we'll be taking a look at what's new in Solid Edge ST10, and this is going to be the first part of a two part series. Uh, for today's agenda, we're going to be taking a look at um, kind of the core functionality added inside of Solid Edge in the part environment. Uh, things like the scale body command for synchronous bodies, um, some hole enhancements. We'll get into the sheet metal environment, uh, some new options with creating cuts over bends and, and how we can edit those and how that solves now. Uh, in the assembly environment, one of my favorite commands, the clone component command. Uh, also how to create a one body assembly and some new options in 3D sketching with the routing path command. And then finally in drafting, uh, we'll take a look at some new uh, options in the whole tables, some uh, extra functionality added to be able to snap to key points for tables and uh, other call outs and annotations, and then uh, also how to make uh, retrieving dimensions associative back to uh, the, the part file that you're retrieving those dimensions from. So again, we're going to focus on the core functionality here in uh, the part one video, and then uh, in part two we'll take a look at some of the other add-on functionalities like generative design, reverse engineering, so, uh, simulation with Flow EFD, and technical publications as well. So we'll go ahead and get started right away looking at uh, the scale body command. So a couple of the uh, the features with the model scaling or the scale body command is we can do uniform or non-uniform scaling. Uh, you're able to go in and change from what point on the model you want to scale from, and we get a nice dynamic preview of that. Um, some different applications where this might be used is if you're trying to scale prototypes, uh, 3D printing, or a big one if you're doing mold design, you want to account for that shrinkage. Uh, we can apply that here while you uh, run the scale body command. Again, going over some of the options here we see on the command bar, we can go in and do a uniform scaling or non-uniform scaling. Uh, we'll take a look at what that does for us in a second. We then have the scale point option that we can select from what point we want to scale to and from, and also our scale factor. Now, the scale body command is going to convert procedural features like holes to a face set. Um, so we see down in the, the pictures at the bottom on the left side it's a face set, but then what we can do is simply run the recognize holes command, which is one of my favorite that was added uh, a while ago, and we can convert that face set into an actual hole. Um, so really, really easy to get that back into an actual feature. All of your synchronous model is then retained after a scaling body, so this is where it's really useful. You still have all of your features listed in the, the Pathfinder. Um, you can still go in and edit things like holes and patterns and so on. Um, but this is also going to work on any sort of imported geometry as well. If you're in the ordered environment, um, again, this might be where you use uh, shrinkage for mold design, something like that. And you'll notice we also get uh, an, uh, a value input in the variable table for this as well. So we'll take a look at an example of that here in just a minute. Um, another little uh, enhancement they've made with some of the math uh, behind synchronous and how we do our synchronous edits and, and blends and whatnot is if we had a, a blend prior to uh, ST10 that consumed an entire face that it was connected to and you try to go in and delete that blend, you just get a, an error. It would fail. It wouldn't let you do it. Um, but now we can actually delete that blend and it'll maintain the original face and it adds just a new face set into the, uh, the Pathfinder. So again, just some uh, enhancements there with the math behind Solid Edge and we'll take a look at an example of that as well. With the whole command we had a couple enhancements. Um, the big thing that we did here is that when you select a hole, you go in and edit that hole uh, and you want to change the hole type, maybe from an ISO to an ANSI hole, something like that. And the past what would happen is it would switch to kind of the default setting of the other standard, which would usually be a really small hole. Um, now what we do though is we try to uh, closely match the existing hole you already have in your model and convert that over into the other standard. So now we see in the example here in the picture we switch over to ANSI standard and a 12 millimeter hole turns to a 0.46 inch uh, size hole, which again closely matches the units from the other standard. So hopefully that'll make changing holes a little bit easier. And then we also have a whole data, uh, database validation tool. In the past uh, we switched to using Excel sheets to store all of our hole types. Um, now when we go in and, and make a change to the Excel sheets, we have a utility that can go in and, and help us find any errors that we might have. Uh, in the past, if something was messed up, you really just kind of had to hunt and find it on your own to see where it was at. 
um, flip through the different tabs for your different types of holes, counterbore, countersink, etc. Uh, but now we can run this executable. We see the, the uh, location where that's stored in the program directory of the solid edge install. Uh, you just run the executable. We can add in that Excel sheet and then uh, take a look at the, the log file and see where our errors are. So again, we'll run an example of that and show you how that, that works and what it looks like. In the sheet metal environment, uh, some new options here with the cutouts across bends. Uh, in the past when we had this and you tried to edit those bends, you'd really get some results that you didn't want. Uh, but now what happens in ST10 is we preserve that original design intent and allows you to create those cutouts across the bend and be able to edit them and drag the flanges and, and things like that. Um, also, if we come in and try to move a cutout, pull it up and down as we see in the top picture, um, if you cross over that bend, it's going to result in an unsuccessful operation. It's going to fail, um, which makes sense. We can't pull that face up past the bend. It doesn't know how to add that extra geometry out in, in space for us. But um, if we go in and grab maybe like the circular cutout, you see how we can shift that and move it across the bend uh, as well. It makes it much easier to edit these types of features in the synchronous environment. Uh, also, some new options in the, the sheet metal environment. Um, the gap corner values, you can now control those in two or three bend corners and the contour flange. Um, we have a gap value that'll pop up that you can then change with the scroll wheel if you like to. That gap corner value in the ordered environment will be added into the, the variable table that you can then go in and drive and edit from that location or use it in any other calculations. But again, that is in the ordered uh, sheet metal environment only. So with that, we're going to go ahead and take a look at the scale body command. Uh, some of the whole enhancements, and some of the new things in the sheet metal environment uh, in some demonstrations here. Our first example we're going to take a look at is the scale body command. So you see here I have a synchronous model. Uh, we're going to go up and then try to scale this up or down and change the size of it. In the past we'd have to do this through like the part co copy command and we would lose all of the history of how the model was created. Uh, but now what we can do is come up underneath the add body drop down up here and we have a new option for scale body. So if you go ahead and run the command, it's going to ask you to select the body you want to scale. I'm going to go ahead and select it and right click to accept it. We can go to the options button on the command bar and this allows us to change between uniform scaling or non-uniform scaling. If we switch over to non-uniform scaling, you see you have different uh, values you can input for the X, Y, and Z uh, axes and the value you want to scale uh, along those different axes. So I'm going to go back in and switch to uniform scaling. What we get to do next is we have to go in and pick the point that we want to scale from. So you can come in and select any key point you want, whether you want a corner, uh, you want a midpoint, whatever you want to do, you can go ahead and, and select any of those key points. Then simply up on the command bar, we just change our scale value. And I'm going to start with maybe half scale, and you get a nice preview of what it's going to look like compared to the original volume of the shape. Um, or we can switch that up to double, which is what I'm going to do uh, for our example here. We'll go ahead and right click to accept that. And there's our scaled body. Now you'll notice this pop-up. Um, as I said in the PowerPoint, it's going to convert all the procedural features like holes to face sets. Do we want to continue? And we just hit yes on this. It's really easy to fix. Uh, with synchronous, we go up and run the recognize holes command. And this instantly recognizes our one hole through the model. We click OK. And now we've got our hole added back to the part file. So that is the new scale body command added in ST10. Our next example is just a short one, um, just to show you some, again, math behind uh, Solid Edge and how it solves some of the, the different geometry uh, creation and deletion that we can do. So I want to go in and delete a face here. Before I do that, I'm going to make an edit. I'm going to pull the top face down and line it up with the top of my blend down here. And what that's going to do is it um, makes the blend basically consume that top face as part of it now. And in the past, this would fail if we tried to come in here and delete that blend. Well, now I can simply grab it and hit delete on the keyboard, and it's gone, and it solves that, uh, that problem there with no issues. So it gets rid of our blend, but it leaves the cylinder in the center, just like we wanted. Uh, the other thing just to take note is that it does leave a face set uh, listed over here in Pathfinder, uh, but that's no issue. We can go in and add a dimension and change the size of that without any problems. Our next example over here was on the hold table and some of the changes they made there. Uh, I want to change the size of this hole up here at the top, so I'm simply going to select it. And we notice right away we get a dimension in there, and it's at 12 millimeters. So I can obviously see that was made using an ISO standard. I'm going to go ahead and select that dimension, go into the Options button on the command bar, 
And again, we see that's an isometric standard with a 12 uh, millimeter diameter hole created in it. What we can do now is I can go up and change the standard maybe to an ANSI inch. And what happens now is it tries to match the diameter of the hole as closely as possible to the diameter of the ISO hole. Uh, like I mentioned in the PowerPoint, what it would do in the past is just switch it back to the default hole, which was usually you know, pretty small, and it, it would uh, mess it up. You'd have to come in and try to go find exactly you know, what size you had before, and a little bit of a pain, but much easier now. If I go ahead and click OK, you'll notice the hole gets a little bit smaller, uh, but it stays roughly the same size, just switched over into the ANSI standard. So a nice little enhancement there with the hole command. Uh, the other thing that's been added is the uh, whole database validation tool. So I've got this opened up here already for us. Again, it's just an executable in the programs folder uh, of wherever you have Solid Edge installed. You simply come over and hit add on the right hand side of the window there. It allows us to browse out and find one of those Excel sheets that we use for our whole table. We can then hit debug and view report to pull up a report of uh, all the issues that it found inside of that Excel table. So we can see we had 12 errors. Um, it tells us one of the sheets is empty. There's a couple duplicate diameters, duplicate values, and so on. So this log file here makes it much easier to actually see what is wrong with your whole database. You can then go in and clean these values up, um, delete empty sheets. You can get rid of duplicate uh, holes, things like that, so that you're working with some nice clean data and you don't run into any issues while you're modeling. So another nice uh, little tool that they added here in ST10. Our next example is going to be a sheet metal example. Uh, we saw this part in the PowerPoint. We have a couple cuts that were created wrapped around the bend, which we've been able to do, but we haven't really had uh, the ability to go in and edit those here in the synchronous environment after we create them. Just a couple things to point out. Uh, if I come in and try to grab the face of this cutout and move it, I can, I can move it down, make the cutout bigger, or I can pull it up. But when I get up over that bend, that's when we're gonna run into that issue of it failing because we can't add that geometry up into kind of empty space over here where it crosses over the bend. So just be aware of that, um, but you can expand it down and make it bigger if you want to. Another thing we can do is we can simply click inside of one of the cutouts and with the, uh, the steering wheel, we can move that hole up or down and change the location of it. And I have design intent turned on, so it's moving the other uh, aligned holes with it. And you notice how it shifts them across the bend, which is really cool to be able to edit like that. Finally, one other thing that we can do is we can actually move the entire flange. So I'm gonna select this face here and start to pull it to the right. And you'll notice all the cutouts come with that uh, movement as well. So I can pull the entire thing over make that flange a little wider. And again, our, our cutouts stay exactly where they were, cross the bend uh, and update accordingly. So a nice enhancement there in the sheet metal environment as well. And with that, we'll switch over to the PowerPoint and uh, take a look at some of our new assembly uh, commands. My favorite command that was added in the assembly environment in SC10 is the clone component command. So what this is going to allow you to do is place multiple occurrences of one or more components, whether it's a part or subassembly, into different locations uh, in your assembly. The parts can be cloned on a single component or on imported geometry or whatever you want at multiple or regular locations. And our placement, though, is going to be based on geometry recognition. So we're going to pick up things like holes or cutouts and use that to then clone to those other locations uh, and the rest of our part or assemblies. Now, the nice thing about this is you have the option to place this with the assembly relationships, which is a little different from the duplicate command. Um, the duplicate component command, which we, we had added a couple versions ago, um, it's going to target a part or coordinate system and uh, orient to match that, that existing orientation of the coordinate system uh, or part file. The duplicate is also going to group the duplicate, uh, excuse me, duplicated components as a pattern and it does not create relationships. So that's kind of the one drawback to the duplicate component command. Now what clone component is going to allow us to do is create those relationships and it's not just grouped as a pattern, um, they are separate occurrences of that part or subassembly. Um, the clone compa component command is found in the home uh, tab in the pattern group. And we can see down here at the bottom our quick bar and a couple of the options. Again, we can try to recreate those relationships. We can just do a straight up ground relationship or do not create any relationships at all. 
um, after it is cloned, we then see here listed in the Pathfinder an assembly group. If you expand that assembly group, we then get to see all of the components. And if you select one of them, you notice it has all of the assembly relationships. Pretty cool. So we'll take a look at an example of that here in just a second. Another new option is the one body assembly. This is going to create a representation of an assembly as a single body. Um, a couple benefits of this is you're able to remove uh, or hide redundant re uh, details. Um, this allows you to maybe protect some of the internals of your assemblies that you don't want to share with other customers or, or companies. This can also be used for maybe complex supplier parts and just use this as sort of a reference part to help out uh, in a layout or something like that, which helps out in the long run with uh, large assembly performance. It takes all of those individual part files and subassemblies, groups it all together into one singular part copy. Then you also have options with this to remove things like the internal voids uh, so that you don't have any cavities on the inside or anything like that. It's just a big single uh, part file. The union command has then been enhanced to create a single design body as well. And then if you run the delete faces command in the ordered environment, there is an option to remove internal voids just like we have uh, with the assembly one body command as well. So some new functionality there to help create simplified geometry and again remove those internals, remove that intellectual property and uh, maintain your designs. Another new option with patterns um, is the ability to specify a skip count for the, the chord length option that was new a couple versions ago. So using skip count allows you to create patterns of two or more components, such as our example we have here, links in a chain. Uh, but it allows you to do this without having to go in and suppress any of the components. Uh, you can see below then a couple of the areas that this has been enhanced in, uh, pattern along curve and assemblies, uh, curved pattern and ordered part or sheet metal, or the curve pattern command and synchronous part or sheet metal as well. When you select the chord length option, there's going to be a new uh, skip value at the end of the command bar where you can key in a value of what you want to skip. Um, but besides that, nothing else has been changed with the command. A couple examples here of what the skip count actually looks like. If we have the skip set to zero, obviously the pattern goes all the way around the curve. If we skip one, uh, then you notice it goes every other. And then we can also uh, go two, three, whatever you guys need to do. A variable was then added uh, for the skip count in the variable table. It's a scalar value, so there's no units on it. Um, your range is going to be greater than or equal to zero. And then you have no limit, though, as far as you want to go with that. Um, any digits after the decimal point are going to be ignored. It has to be a whole number. Another really good enhancement that I liked was in the 3D sketching environment, um, a routing path command. Uh, if you've ever done the path express command inside of uh, like express route, wire harness, something like that, it's the same functionality, but now in the 3D sketching environment. So this allows us to create a path between any key points, not just center points. We can go in and apply colors and line styles to it, and uh, you can create paths relative to user-defined coordinate systems. This can uh, be used then uh, over and over again, creating multiple tubes or routes or things like that, since it is just a sketch that lives outside of the express route environment. Um, again, you're able to pick up that sketch and, and use it for different things. Unlike with Path Express, you're kind of tied to only using that path in that specific environment. We can use this 3D sketch path wherever we need to. Another new option then that was added into 3D sketching is the split command. So we had a split for uh, some of the lines. It, it worked okay, but now this split command can be used on all of our 3D sketching elements. Um, segment split could only be used on line segments. This can be run on arcs, curves, um, whatever you got. It can split it. It will create then relationships where you split the, the lines or the curves. So what that means for things like framing or uh, tubes here that we have a couple examples of is it is going to impact um, those 3D sketches of those elements. Uh, you'll notice some features will stop at that split or we get a split line and it creates a second feature after that split point. Uh, so just keep that in mind if you use the split command on any sort of 3D sketches that are used downstream elsewhere. And uh, with that, we'll go ahead and switch back over to Solid Edge and take a look at a couple of examples.
The first example I want to take a look at is the clone component command. Again, one of my favorites here. So uh, we have a, an assembly with a subassembly placed inside of it, and we want to put that in some other locations uh, on our model here. What I'm going to do is select that subassembly and go up in the pattern group and select the new clone component command. Now after you select your component, what we can do is go in and pick the geometry that we want to clone from. And in our case, we're going to pick the holes uh, here in the part file. So I'm going to grab these uh, two holes here. We'll accept that as the geometry we want to clone from. Now we get to pick where we want to find that uh, in the rest of the, the assembly. And I want to find it on both the top part and the bottom part. And you see instantly it finds those holes and places that subassembly in it. Now, a couple of the occurrences might have come in upside down. Depending on how you created those holes initially, um, maybe I put it left to right or right to left, something like that, just however you created it, that's going to determine how the instances are placed in here. Now, I can flip them over, though, if they are backwards. So I'm going to accept this, and I have options now to reverse that and flip it around and change them. So I can go in and pick uh, the red dots here in the center, and I can hold down the Control key and go pick multiple instances if I want to. So I'm going to pick these four here that are upside down and then flip them. Now there is actually also a suppress or remove occurrence on here as well if you want to remove one or two of them. Uh, maybe you got too many in there accidentally. Uh, we can also go into the options button on the command bar. We could uh, excuse me, create the relationships. We can ground relationships or we can not create any relationships. And then you also have the option to group or not group the components. So I'm going to leave all the defaults, click OK and hit finish and it's going to go through and create each one of those subassemblies and fully constrain them as well so if we come up and expand our assembly group and select one of the subassemblies we see down here in the bottom of Pathfinder all of the individual assembly relationships that have been applied between those components so uh, good expansion upon the duplicate component command allows us to clone the components and maintain uh, those relationships which is huge The next example is the skip count in a, a pattern along a curve. So what we're going to do is select uh, our component that we want to pattern here, one of our chain components. We'll go up and do a pattern along a curve, select the curve we want to pattern along, and where we want this uh, pattern to start from, I'm going to flip that over, and we're going to start it also from the center point of the chain there just to make sure we're in the right spot. Um, and we'll notice we go through and it starts to create the pattern. And if I have my skip count set to zero, we get an occurrence uh, at every point, you know, every six millimeters in our case, which would go all the way around the pattern. But what I can do is switch that to one, and with the chord length option, it goes every other occurrence in the pattern. If we go ahead and hit neck, we change our setting to follow curve chord, we then get the occurrences to follow that actual curve all the way around. We can go ahead and do the same thing if we select the other component in our chain here, do pattern along a curve. We'll pick up our curve. We'll grab our starting point, and we actually want to start from the center of this chain. And we should have the same setting, same spacing. We also want to skip one. We'll hit next, follow curve chord. And there we go, we have our finished chain. Just take that a step further. We can animate that real quick if we want to go up and do a variable table motor. We'll pick the variable we want to drive, set a limit of maybe 500 millimeters, and we'll also drive the other pattern as well. Since we have two separate patterns now, we want to go in and drive uh, both of the values separately from one another. So I'm going to go in and select our other variable, give that one a limit as well, and now we can simulate our motors and get our chain to move together. So that is the new skip count option when using the chord length setting in a pattern along a curve. Another uh, new assembly option that we had was in the 3D sketching environment. So I have a couple components here. Now you could go into like Express Route and do this, or you can also do it, in our case, maybe as an assembly feature inside of the 3D sketching environment and then the routing path option. So you should be able to go in and select uh, starting points on either one of your subassemblies or any of your components. I'll come over in and select two center points here, one on each side of my assembly. 
and it creates a segment between those points. I can then toggle through the different options to get uh, different routes that I want between those points. You also have settings for line color, line type, and line width. And we can go ahead and accept and finish that and create that sketch. Now, like I said, that sketch can be picked up inside of Express Route or Wire Harness and used to run multiple paths uh, along that same sketch, which is some really nice functionality that they've added here as well. And with that, we'll switch back over and take a look at some of the drafting enhancements. So one of the, uh, one of the new things that was added uh, are some new options with the whole table. We have some new properties that are going to be similar to other table properties. Um, whether you're doing a parts list or bill of materials. And we also have some uh, column properties that are specific properties to the whole tables as well. Uh, an options tab uh, has been added with some new options to place center marks on the holes automatically when we create the table and also to place leader break lines if we want to. A new tab has also been created called whole number. Um, it's been added to help control the attribute callouts for the holes. Um, if you want it to be called 1.1 .1 or a.1 or anything like that, we can go in and relabel all of the holes to whatever you guys need to do. Uh, one of my favorite enhancements for the drafting environment is this one here, adding key point snaps for tables. We can now uh, locate our tables to any key point. Um, as we move the table around, you'll notice you're going to get a display of different endpoints, midpoints, things like that. So it allows you to snap that table and accurately place and position that table uh, to any selectable geometry in your, your background sheet or your drawings. Um, after you've placed the table, you can go back in and move it again by selecting the table and then grabbing that origin point, that original blue dot, and then we can drag it and move it and locate off of another piece of geometry if we need to. There's a new option in the IntelliSketch group while you're in the drafting environment to make the background sheet locatable. This allows you to precisely place again things like tables or we can precisely snap uh, callouts or balloons or anything like that to specific key point locations uh, on the background sheet. This is a toggle that we can toggle on and off. Um, so you don't want to keep this on all the time but we can toggle it on, locate what we need to and then toggle it back off. If you've ever run the retrieve dimensions command uh, in the drafting environment, those dimensions and annotations and callouts are not associative. So if the dimensions change back at the part file, the dimensions would not update um, here at the, the drafting level. So new options have been added in the solid edge options that we can turn on maintain associativity for retrieve dimensions. What that allows us to do, um, it'll check for out of date state for the dimensions. Um, for the on a date comparison, the, the text and a couple geometry parameters of the dimensions and annotations are going to be compared during the file open. And if they are on a date, the value has changed and the dimension hasn't updated to, to match it, it'll be kind of a disabled color. It'll be a grayish looking color. Um, the entire geometry of that object is going to be shown in that color as well. So we, we see it down in the bottom picture, it's kind of in a grayish color. Uh, what we can do then is, is retrieve the out of date dimensions. There's a new command added in the dimensions group called update retrieve dimensions. Um, and we can run this and then it goes back and looks uh, for those dimensions, any changes you might have made to them. Maybe you add things like tolerancing to some of your dimensions. Those new attributes that you added can then be pulled up here in the drafting environment. In the parts list, we have some options to add cut length into balloons. Um, there is a new property text added underneath graphic connection. We're going to have things called parts list cut, cut length, parts list item number, parts list quantity. We can go through then and select one of those features and it's going to add in those new callouts uh, with a new property in them as well. And this will be added then into to things like balloons or callouts if you need to. At the table level, uh, we have a, a new level of cell overrides. So what we can do is right click on a cell, go in and, and view the property text, and right at the table level we can add in some formatting. Things like rounding or decimal places or units, we can add those in and edit them right at the table level. So we can see in the bottom picture uh, our initial value here of the cut length has three decimals. We can override it though, add in a format code of one decimal 
and we see that overridden value down here in our table. And finally, another new option, we can now do undo after you create drawing views. So this has always been a little bit of an issue in the past. After you created a view, if you want to get rid of it, you had to go in and select it and delete it. You couldn't just hit undo. So now you're able to uh, undo that action, get rid of any drawing views like orthographic views, pictorial views, derived views, uh, such as de detail views or section views. They can be undone and gotten rid of that way instead of deleting them. We can also undo drawing view updates. So if you open up a drawing, you hit update, you see what changed maybe in the table or the, the part views, we can hit undo if you want to get rid of those changes. Um, so another new option that we have, again, just to help out with some functionality in the drafting environment. So with that, we're going to take a look at some of these enhancements uh, in person on some examples. First thing I want to do is take a look at some custom occurrence properties and things like callouts or balloons. So if we go ahead and take a look at one of our parts and go into the occurrence properties of it, we can see over at the end here under notes, it has a note applied to it. Right hand side, the other side also has a note that says left hand side. So what we can do is pull those occurrence properties out and add them into a callout or balloon. So if we go under the PMI tab into the callout command and we go into our property text, we can select from graphic connection and you see at the top here we see our difference occurrence properties. So I'm going to double click on notes and what's different, uh, excuse me, what's different about these is they have a slash OP for occurrence property. So just a little bit different but that's how we can pull these out. If we go ahead and click OK we can then add that onto one of our part files and call out those different occurrence properties here at the assembly level or uh, the same thing applies at the drafting level. Our next example, if we go over here to uh, uh, a draft file, is we can make um, balloons or callouts associative to the background sheet. So if I go in and create a callout here, and I'm just going to type in something, um, whatever I want, maybe something like Solid Edge is the king of draft. We can click OK. And you'll notice now that I can highlight and pick up the, uh, the edges of the background sheet. Now to turn that off, it's underneath the sketching tab and here in the bottom right of the IntelliSketch group. So if I toggle that off and try to place my callout again, you notice I can't connect it to anything. Um, I'm going to go ahead and place it. We'll turn it back on and if I come back in and now try to drag it, I can snap it to that geometry to any key point I want and have it attached there. So some nice functionality, being able to move those and uh, attach callouts or tables or whatever we want to those background sheets with our new uh, locate background option here. Next thing we want to do is be able to add in cut lengths from our parts list into things like callouts and balloons. So we're going to do this underneath the balloon command. I'm going to go up uh, into the properties and we're going to type in uh, some new properties in here. So I'm going to select my upper field. We'll go into the property text button and say from graphic connection to part. I'm going to scroll down and we're going to pick the uh, parts list item number. We'll double click that and add that in here. And then we can go ahead and do the same thing. And I've already got it added here for the part uh, parts list cut length as well. So once we have both those added, I can come down, connect it to any one of my frame members and get the number and the length of it as well. If we take a look at our table, we can override some of the values now a lot easier than we could in the past. So what I'm going to do is double click to edit into the table. Um, and we are going to override this cell. And we can go in and say show property text. This is a new option up here in the right click menu to turn that on. So when I double click to edit into that cell, we see the property text code. I can then add my format. We'll do a backslash at one to change our rounding value to a, a one decimal place. We'll hit enter and there we see our new value. So now we can come in and edit those property texts. We can see them here in the cells and then we can format them appropriately. I can always go in and clear the cell overrides. It'll get rid of that rounding then uh, for me as well. And that's what's new in the drafting environment. So that's all I have for you guys today. Uh, just uh, again, a little recap of what we'll see in part two coming up. Uh, these are a lot of the add-ons and the, uh, a lot of the newer stuff that they worked on here for ST10. Things like generative design, 
being able to do some reverse engineering working with imported uh, point clouds or surface data STL files. Uh, simulation with our Flow EFD um, coming from Enter Graphics. It's an awesome program. Can't wait to show you that one. Um, as well as technical publications, some new data management options with the built-in data management, and also the Solid Edge portal. So uh, be on the lookout for that video soon. Once again, uh, thanks for your time. I hope you guys enjoyed this video. Um, if you have any questions or, or suggestions for future Lunch Bite topics, please send me an email. And thanks and have a great day. Ally PLM.